your books, Professor Horn, tell us the story of resistance once the enslaved Africans arrived in the New World plantations after the long journey. You point out that 1688 is the date that you choose to mark the onset of the dawning apocalypse. Why don't you take us back to the moment at the dawn of the slave trade in the Americas and the emergence of the critical concepts of whiteness that became central to global capitalism? Perhaps I should make a point or two about the preceding century of the 1500s. That is to say, during that particular century, at least at its beginning, England was a minor monarchy on the fringes of Europe. However, that changed over the next century or more. It changed not least because Europe was enmeshed in religious conflict. You had the Ottoman Turks on the east. You had the Iberian Catholics on the west. By 1517, you had the rise of Martin Luther and England, for various reasons that need not detain us here, adopted the Protestant sect, as it was then called, which unleashed a tidal wave of religious conflict. But what happens is that London fundamentally cuts a deal with Muslim forces against their fellow Christians, speaking of the Iberian Catholics. This allows London a certain breathing space, which leads to its establishing of an abortive colony in what we now call North Carolina in the 1500s. But the permanent colony, if you will, is established in what we call Virginia in 1607. Spain, which then occupied Florida, was so bogged down in battling the indigenous of Florida and their African allies that they were not able to sail northward to block the English colony in what is Virginia. Now let me fast forward to 1688. Uh, By that point, the Virginia colony, as you can infer from doing the math, had been in existence uh, for a few decades. But what happens is that in the interregnum, you had the crown, the monarch, involved in establishing the Royal African Company, which in many ways had a stranglehold over England's participation in the African slave trade. By 1688, the ascending merchants had had enough of that. They wanted to elbow the monarch aside and grab a piece of this lucrative trade because you could invest $1, perhaps get $1,700 back, I dare say that today there might be entrepreneurs who would sell their firstborn for 1,700% profit. And that is the precursor, that is the prelude to the so-called glorious revolution, uh, whereby the wings of the monarch were clipped, leading to today's King Charles III, for example, who wields significant financial and economic heft but at least on the surface, does not wield that much political heft. And notice that I'm hedging my words here. In any case, with the so-called Glorious Revolution, you had a skyrocketing of London's participation in the African slave trade. On the one hand, uh, this brought enormous wealth to London, not least because of Africans driven kicking and screaming across the Atlantic, not only to North America, but to the so-called colonies in Jamaica, Barbados, etc. On the other hand, these were unwilling and unpaid workers. They were rebelling every step of the way, and particularly in Jamaica, which developed early on a justifiable reputation for rebelliousness, which may have something to do with the topography of Jamaica because it's very hilly and mountainous as opposed to Barbados, which in many ways preceded Jamaica as a colony of London. And obviously then the topography come rebelliousness has impact on the subsequent political culture of these uh, two particular sites. But North America 
is not left unscathed as well. As early as 1712, you have a major revolt of the enslaved in New York City, in Manhattan. These revolts of the enslaved unfold in succeeding decades in the 18th century, in Antigua, for example, in the 1730s, in South Carolina, for example, in the 1730s, with Stono's Revolt, which is one of the bloodiest revolts of the enslaved in the history of colonial North America. Uh, What's striking about Stono's Revolt is that early on, (laughs) you see the Africans playing a kind of diplomatic game. That is to say, in the prelude to Stono's revolt, you had Africans in Spanish military uniforms coming across the border from Florida to stir up the enslaved in South Carolina. You had Africans in uniform in Florida, Spanish Florida, not necessarily the case in the Anglo colonies. In any case, With this rebelliousness, what happens is that London decides that the better part of wisdom is to try to establish a buffer between South Carolina, well on its way to being a profitable and lucrative slave colony, and Spanish Florida, where the Spanish are trying to stir up the Africans as part of the great game between the Protestant power in London and the Catholic power in Madrid. And so that leads to the attempt to establish a so-called white colony in Georgia in the 1730s. Interestingly enough, when this is oftentimes taught in the schools, is taught as a way to establish an abolitionist colony. I think that that's, shall we say, an exaggeration, if not a falsehood. But the idea was that uh, the Africans were unreliable politically, and so they should not be allowed. But then again, that raises other questions, because who is going to do the work in the fields to make Georgia profitable? Poor Europeans, uh, it was thought, would not work, would not function properly, I say, and I would say in that capacity, and that uh, it would introduce class contradictions between and amongst the Europeans, which was supposedly the province of Europe in which the settlers had escaped when they crossed the Atlantic. So sooner rather than later, what established itself is one of the primary traits of these settlers, which is smuggling. They begin to smuggle Africans into Georgia. And of course, per the 2010 census and the results in the United States of America, Georgia had the largest black population in the United States, which obviously meant that the idea of a white colony did not necessarily pan out. So what happens as a result of all of this turmoil in the colonies is that finally uh, London decides that it should oust the Spanish from Florida, it should oust the French from Quebec, because as I should have said, mentioning 1712, that there had been this collaboration between the French in Quebec and the Africans uh, in Manhattan. And so that leads to the so-called Seven Years' War, or sometimes called the French and Indian War, uh, 1756 to 1763. London is successful in terms of establishing its stranglehold over Canada, although, as we well know, there is still a, quote, restive, unquote, French-speaking population in Quebec, as we speak. And at least for a while, they had ousted the Spanish from Florida. Uh, But then the complications ensue, the complications arise, because then they go to the settlers in North America and make, from their point of view, a reasonable request, which is that uh, we're going to raise taxes to subsidize this uh, war-making venture, which was for your benefit. And I'm sure you know the rest of the story. The the settlers, even to this very day, perhaps because of emerging from a slave colony, many times they want services, but they don't want to pay for them. And that is the case here. And it's complicated even further by events in 1772, Somerset's case in London, where a Scottish judge seems to suggest that 
the abolition of slavery, which is effectuated in England, could leapfrog the Atlantic, seems to suggest, I must underscore, and that could obviously jeopardize uh, slave fortunes by those who ultimately revolt. Uh, speaking of that murderer's row of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Patrick Henry uh, at all. Not only that, but with the Seven Years' War, the so-called French and Indian War, London felt that it was not a wise investment to keep expanding westward across the continent, uh, coming into conflict with the indigenous population who were fighting to keep their land, London having to expend blood and treasure to that end, and then the land in many ways is turned over to real estate speculators, uh, such as real estate speculator George Washington, who, of course, uh, has bequeathed his uh, mercenary tendencies during the 21st century when you had another real estate speculator assume the highest office in the land. I would suggest that these double barrel challenges, that is to say, the challenge perceived towards enslavement and the challenge perceived towards conquest of the land, helped to generate a revolt spearheaded in the first instance by real estate speculators and slave owners that leads to a war against London, a war that it's fair to say the settlers would not have won, but for the existence of those European powers with grievances against London. That is to say, the aforementioned French uh, still licking their wounds after being ousted from Canada, and the aforementioned Spanish uh, still licking their wounds after being ousted, at least temporarily, from Spain. And so, therefore, the settlers triumph, <laughs> and here we are. You write about the roots of capitalism and, of course, integral to the structure of capitalism is racialization and the racism that is the engine for capitalism. Can you talk a little bit about how around this time, whiteness, the category of whiteness becomes tactically malleable by necessity? to boost the number of settlers compared to the indigenous and African populations that are rising up on mainland U.S.? Well, once again, I have to return to the 1500s and reference here my comments about religious conflict uh, between Muslims and Christians and between Protestants and Catholics. This is described at length in my book on the 16th century. However, to telescope it here, what happens is that I would suggest in an improvisational manner, London does an end run around religious conflict. I mean, first of all, there are nothing being Protestants to go around. And so they were not able, unlike the Spanish and their colonies in the Americas, to establish being Catholic as a marker for settlement. In, in my book on the 16th century, I talk about all of these different successful attempts by the Spanish to oust Europeans from Florida, potential settlers, who they discover are not Catholics. By the same token, in Spanish Cuba, you had Africans who could become conquistadors, not unlike those Africans in Spanish uniforms who I talked about were coming across the border from Florida. These Africans could wield weapons on behalf of his Catholic majesty if they professed Catholicism. London improvised and in some ways came up with the winning ticket, which is migrating from religion as a marker for being a settler to race. Now, number one, this allowed the English to make a kind of peace with those they had been battling in the British Isles, speaking of the Scots and the Irish and the Welsh in the first instance, just as a footnote, I don't find it accidental that as the British Empire goes into decline, the Scots become more interested in establishing their independence, which I dare say will probably take place during the current reign of King Charles III. So this construction of whiteness, it 
increase the population base for potential settlers, and then it curbed internal antagonisms between those who had been warring on the shores of Europe, such as the murderous conflicts between English and Irish, the murderous conflicts between English and Scots. Uh, magically, as they crossed the Atlantic in a rebranding exercise that would make Madison Avenue blush, they were rebranded as white and inducted into the hollow halls of whiteness. Eventually, this rebranding exercise was able to encompass what London in the 20th century called uh, all those of, quote, pure European descent. And so those who had been warring on the shores of Europe, Britain versus Germans, uh, Germans versus Russians, Poles versus Croats, Northern Italians versus Southern Italians, the list is endless in terms of European conflicts, but suddenly when they cross the Atlantic, <laughs> they're all white. And of course, this also has an advantage if you flip the coin over, because those not inducted into the hollow halls of whiteness are then deemed to be inferior stock, subject to being enslaved in the case of Africans or liquidated in the case of the indigenous. And then in the resultant United States of America, this racialization process reaches new heights, or perhaps you could even say new heights of absurdity, because with regard to how racialization evolves in the United States, you have the so-called one-drop rule, where you can resemble Madonna or George W. Bush, but if you have the faintest hint of African ancestry, you're deemed to be Black. I've had people criticize me because, uh, I mean, th this is a cultural construct. And so if the cultural construction is that Barack Obama is Black, even though his mother is not, who am I to then waste this one-man campaign pointing out the absurdity for, especially since he seems to accept it. Now, what am I supposed to do? Tell him that he's on the wrong track? And then at the, at the same time, with regard to uh, Native Americans, there is an attempt to seize the land, which leads to a different kind of blood quantum, if you like, with regard to empowering European settlers who merge into indigenous families or even masquerade as being indigenous. That's accepted, that they can be called Kurt Cherokee, and then they have a claim to the land, uh, for example. And obviously, these sociological constructions have a ultimate purpose of economic exploitation and, of course, class peace to a certain extent, because a part of the, quote, secret, unquote, of the United States of America is class collaboration. That is to say, the unpaid workers who were the enslaved oftentimes found it difficult to find solidarity with the paid workers who were poor European, for example. And then if you look at, once again, to return to Cherokee country, you see the attempt by the Cherokee, amongst other indigenous, including the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Crete at all, to adapt to the settler's regime, adapt in terms of professing Christianity, adapt in the sartorial sense in the way they dress, adapt in terms of enslaving Africans. Fortunately, there are Cherokee newspapers as well and a Cherokee alphabet, which are bilingual which scholars, including myself, are, are still using to this very day. But they still had to go. <laughs> I mean, despite their adaptation, despite enslaving Africans, uh, and of course they're centered in the southeast quadrant of North America, Georgia, the Carolinas, perhaps a bit west to what we call Tennessee and what we call Georgia and the Carolinas, and approximately... 200 plus years ago, they had to embark on this, this, the Trail of Tears. They had to go and had to make their way to what was called Indian Territory, now Oklahoma, which was supposed to be this massive Bantustan, to use the apartheid term, for the indigenous population for as long as the rivers shall flow and the grass shall grow. But of course, that promise wasn't kept either because Oklahoma entered the Union in 1907 as a state. The indigenous oftentimes uh, ousted. And so this is the uh, 
ugly and inglorious story of this elongated process of racialization, a process that probably has not met its end point, although I'm not sure in which direction it will be heading. You're listening to The Brief with John Elmer and me, Nora Barrows-Friedman. Follow us on Twitter at The Brief Pod. And now back to The Brief. So the founding myths of the creation of the United States almost seem like they're divinely inevitable, that there might have been some struggle, but only insofar as that strengthened the pioneering spirit. But you write what happened in 1776 was not inevitable and that Africans had a different plan. And you have a number of really interesting quotes from the governors at the time talking about the quantity of Negroes on our shores that threaten an insurrection of the Negroes. Other colonial governors talking about how the Negroes had damnable designs to destroy their masters and that they were a warlike and robust people. They're not bit players, the Africans, in this story. The lieutenant governor of Virginia in 1722 said that there was a Negro plan that wasn't simply for liberation or revenge, but to cut the head off the master and possess for himself the land. And this is an interesting moment in history because the laws that allowed the settlers to toil the land would have been presumably at least somewhat sympathetic to an overthrow by the people who had actually been toiling the land for generations. Maybe you could talk about this, you know, the alternative history, how at the point of the creation of the United States as a, you know, a white capitalist state, that there was a different plan. First of all, like any exploited class, the class of unpaid workers, had an incentive to (laughs) change the status quo, to disrupt the status quo uh, by any means necessary. That oftentimes involved alliances with indigenous groupings. It can involve alliances with uh, foreign powers, for example. Even before the triumph of the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, which was a triumph of the unpaid working class, and therefore needs to be celebrated in world history in a way for whatever reason it has not been to this point. Even before that triumph, you had uh, abortive attempts to precede Haiti. Uh, Speaking of uh, what happened in Antigua in the 1730s, what was happening in Jamaica all along? And indeed, it's fair to suggest that the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, ignites a general crisis of the entire slave system, which can only be resolved with this collapse because London saw the writing on the wall. There was evidence to suggest that the Africans from neighboring Jamaica had played a role in what we call the Haitian Revolution. And as I said, the Jamaicans, the African Jamaicans all along were struggling to break the shackles. And so uh, London proceeded by 1807 to evacuate from the African slave trade, and then by 1833 to pull out of slavery altogether, but of course uh, providing a kind of bounty uh, to the slaveholders, which was not paid off until the late 20th century in terms of these payments for losing their property, so-called after slavery was abolished. No reparations to the enslaved, although that issue has been joined mightily today And it's something that King Charles III is going to have to grapple with, uh, which may wind up tampering with his misbegotten wealth. But once again, turning the coin over, as I try to suggest that because of these multiple challenges to settler rule in North America, that the rulers had to be quite flexible, to put it mildly, in terms of offering emoluments to potential settlers to attract them to a war zone. And as I tell the story, uh, this amounts to a kind of combat pay, just as when the Pentagon uh, sends its minions into a war zone in, say, Afghanistan, Iraq, you get an extra bonus, so to to speak. So that's the lens 
through which I interpret, for example, uh, many of the so-called democratic rights, which of course did not apply <laughs> to the unpaid working class. And then if you look at more carefully at the so-called democratic rights, I have to say it makes some of us question the acuity of some of our so-called progressive and radical forebearers who I think uh, may have not analyzed the situation properly. I mean, for example, if you look at the First Amendment with regard to freedom of religion, obviously that helps to evade and elude the religious conflict that had driven people across the Atlantic uh, so many times in previous decades. That is to say, uh, no establishment of religion, unlike in London, for example, a free exercise of religion. This allows Europeans of whatever religious heritage, Protestant, Catholic, and as a result, uh, struggle even uh, Jewish folk. There's this famous letter that George Washington uh, sends to the Jewish community in Newport in the 1790s, pledging religious freedom. Now, of course, even some of our radical friends have said, oh, that shows how progressive the United States is. They're different from the Europeans with all this anti-Semitism. They need warm bodies to confront these Africans and these indigenous. And then if you look at the Second Amendment with regard to well-regulated militia, well, you need a well-regulated militia to be on the ground to confront these warring indigenous and oftentimes their African allies. And so this helps to shape the trajectory of the United States. And right now, in 2022, as we stare into the barrel of an emergent neo-fascism, I think that that's helped to capture the attention and focus and concentrate the imagination and minds of many people who are beginning to see what this United States of America is all about, because obviously there is a disjuncture between these creation myths, these romantic stories about establishing a sturdy democracy, and the ugliness that we face today in terms of neo-fascism. At least those who peddle those tales need to instruct us as to how did this happen? I mean, how do you go from this so-called sturdy democracy, a great leap forward for humanity, to 2022, talking about the rise of fascism. Even Joe Biden is talking about the rise of fascism. <laughs> He's heading this enterprise. So fortunately, better late than never, to quote that aphorism, people are awakening, but not woke, sorry. Don't send the government <laughs> more of it after me. Uh, they're just awakening. They're not woke. No, God forbid. Just curious, what was your reaction, bringing you back to today, what was your reaction to mainstream liberal corporate media calling the January 6th as an insurrection or, or that they, you know, these clowns were being referred to as insurrectionists? What was your reaction to that? Well, immediately I reference here my story about indigenous slave owners in Oklahoma. And of course, the last Confederate military leader to surrender to the soldiers in blue uh, was a Cherokee, a Standwati, a W-A-T-I-E. And of course, the indigenous slave owners had to disgorge more of their property, uh, more of their land and other wealth to the enslaved than their comrades in, say, South Carolina or Mississippi or even neighboring Texas, which then leads to a certain kind of enrichment of the Black community in Oklahoma, which is then wiped out by the 1921 so-called Tulsa Massacre, which, and this brings us to uh, January 6th, the connection that I have been drawing, it, it's, it's a classic cross-class collaboration. That is to say, settlers uniting across class lines, in, in some ways defying the presumed edict of they're supposed to be involved in class struggle. <laughs> no, they're involved in class collaboration uh, for mutual advantage. And so likewise, if you look at January 6, 2021, what I find striking is the class makeup of those who in invade the Capitol. You have people flying in on private airplanes. You have CEOs. You have military veterans. You have shopkeepers. You have ordinary working class people. Interestingly enough, by some measures, 
Texas supplies more of those who invaded the capital than any other state, even though they had a much further distance to go to get to the capital than, say, people in Virginia who could just take a metro ride into the capital or even walk <laughs> into the capital, uh, for example. Obviously, I'm mentioning that because it ties into my latest book which deals with Texas and the roots of U.S. Uh, neo-fascism. And so I think that what's happening in the United States today, for various reasons, is a migration from a kind of conservatism to counter-revolution, with counter-revolution being a major force in terms of the establishment of the settler colony in the first instance, going back to 1776, not to mention what the United States has tried to export abroad. That is to say, trying to export counter-revolution to Cuba, trying to export counter-revolution to Vietnam, trying to export counter-revolution to Venezuela. And now the chickens have come home to roost. Now the time has come for counter-revolution in North America itself. You talk about, in your book, you talk about the Negro forts. Can you tell mm -hmm. us about the Negro forts and how they operated? Yeah. So I had mentioned that the Africans were not adverse to establishing alliances, which obviously made eminent good sense since they were outnumbered and oftentimes outgunned. And so this was particularly the case in Florida, particularly northern Florida where going back to Spanish times, which commences uh, circa, what, 1565, with the first arrival of Spanish settlers uh, on the peninsula, you had these alliances between the Africans and the indigenous of Northern Florida, which then leads us to the Negro Fort approximately 200 years ago, which is established there as a kind of embattled fortification. Now, keep in mind that the United States does not seize Florida till about 1821. So this is the period before 1821. But obviously, there's talk in the air about uh, the United States taking over. And so the Africans and the indigenous established this embattled fortification, which is then supported in turn by London, because this is taking place in the context of the War of 1812, as it's called here in the United States, whereby the United States was trying to seize Canada, British territory, and the British were trying to engage in re revanchist claims to detake what is now the United States of America. Of course, the, the British had uh, indigenous allies, the uh, great uh, indigenous warrior Tecumseh, as he's called in the United States, uh, uh, died uh, fighting alongside uh, his British comrades against the uh, settlers. And of course, this is nothing new. What I mean is that if you look at historically at the grand arc of settler colonialism, if you look at Zimbabwe, I wrote a book about Zimbabwe, when the settlers uh, in what was then called Rhodesia try to secede from the crown and say they're walking in the footsteps of 1776. This is 1965, of course. The crown is not necessarily supportive of the settlers because the world has changed. The winds have changed, as a former British prime minister once articulated. And so the Africans then found themselves in a kind of objective alliance with the crown against the settlers in Rhodesia. And that movement ultimately uh, succeeded in ousting settler rule. And so you had a, a, a sort of replica of that at the time of the Negro Fort. That is to say, the Africans, the indigenous in North Florida, backed by uh, the British. But what happens is that uh, Andrew Jackson gets a lucky shot in. I recall that if you take out your wallet, I'm sure you'll find a picture of him on your $20 bill. And this is what catapults him into prominence. Uh, he helps destroy the Negro fort because he shoots a shot or his forces shoot a shot into the Negro fort, which causes an explosion and helps to wipe out the Negro fort. But that does not wipe out this legacy of African indigenous collaboration, which is a counterpoint 
to indigenous enslavement of Africans. For example, in my book on Texas, I talk about the relationship between the Africans and the Caddo, C-A-D-D-O. Now, of course, if you look at your map in typical settler style, you'll find many provinces and towns, et cetera, named after the Caddo. This is this, this quirk uh, of these settlers. They oust the people, then they keep their names. Just like you, you have a, a, a vehicle <laughs> called the Jeep Cherokee, <laughs> for, yeah. for example. The Apache gunship, right? Yeah, or exactly. any of those military I mean, terms. Right, exactly, exactly. It's, it's very curious, I, I must say. And in any case, that was just one emblem of this longstanding relationship between the indigenous and the Africans, a relationship which I have to say was turned on its head post-U.S. Civil War. And this, this is why we continually need the rewriting of history, because I don't think the Black leadership post-Civil War, including the uh, vaunted Frederick Douglass, Douglass, the abolitionist, really thought through everything. For example, a celebrated police in Texas are the Buffalo Soldiers, these Black soldiers uh, under the Stars and Stripes, who were the tip of the spear in terms of routing the indigenous in West Texas and Eastern New Mexico, et cetera. At the same time, their brothers and sisters in East Texas were being lynched and routed by the Ku Klux Klan. Now, obviously that makes no sense. And likewise, the, the next biography that's written to Frederick Douglass and of that period is going to have to at least have a footnote about how the post- 1865 Negro leadership, they made a strategic blunder when they did not lead or begin to at least discuss a worldwide campaign against slavery, which of course did not magically disappear once it disappeared in the United States. And in fact, uh, even to this very day, there are cases of slavery in the United States or cases of what's called wage theft, which is a kind of euphemism. And uh, not to mention, uh, a kind of blunt embracing slavery in places like uh, Mauritania in Northwest Africa. Contrary to many of our legislators who think that we know everything we need to know about history, uh, some might say we know everything we need to know about mythology, uh, we, we continually need to reinvestigate that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Francis Fukuyama talked about the end of history. Well, now, there's discussion about the end of historiography. That is to say, we know everything we need to know about 1776. There can be no further advances, no further insight, end of story. And of course, if you challenge that minimally, you can lose your job. When you're writing your next book on Texas and when you're looking at the rise of fascism here in the belly of the beast, you know, underpinned by imperialist, capitalist plans for the rest of the planet and humanity. How do you take a survey of the U.S. empire right now after, you know, 400 years of <laughs> its history of genocide and of the, the insurrections by those who white settler history would rather forget or ignore? What are your thoughts going forward right now? Well, it, it's mixed. I would say in the short term, I must say things don't look very good in, in terms of this resurgent neo-fascist movement, which is armed, which is a, poised to send into high office election deniers who are basically saying that the only two outcomes of an election is that either they win or they were cheated. That does not bode very well. I'm afraid to say, <laughs> for uh, democratic advance or even the status quo in the United States. But on the other, other hand, if you look at the international scene, and I've written about this uh, at, at some length, as a matter of fact, in my 16th century book, I draw a parallel between how the Protestants cut a deal with the Muslims, who are supposedly their theological and religious antipode against the interests of their fellow Christians, speaking of the Catholics in the Iberian Peninsula. And I repeatedly in that book, 
which most reviewers, for whatever reason, have noted. I draw a parallel between what's happening today, because 50 years ago, we well know that Nixon went to China. And, and it's in my estimation that that's really what transformed the world, as Nixon and Kissinger said. But alas, many bargains do not last forever. <laughs> and so now that deal, which led to massive foreign direct investment in China, creating this juggernaut, and of course, China upheld its end of the bargain by waging war on Vietnam. You notice that Vietnam is very, very mum nowadays <laughs> with regard to all these U.S.-China issues, for good reason, perhaps. And so now the United States is trying to reverse the impact of 1972. It's not clear if they'll be able to, particularly uh, because of the strength of the Chinese economy and the wobbliness, I would say, of the European allies, who at least thus far are willing to uh, stick by the United States with regard to Ukraine, not so much with regard to China. And so that presents a real challenge to U.S. imperial hegemony. Now, I'm not saying that the end result will be Shangri-La, but it is fair to say that it could shake U.S. imperialism to its foundations. And the bad news, of course, is what I started off talking about, which is what will be the impact upon the balance of forces right here at home. And I'm not willing to venture a guess at this point. Dr. Gerald Horn, thanks so much for coming on the brief and uh, and spending the hour with us. This has been um, really illuminating.